right, now we're recording. All right, so a few things. Um, <clears throat> I have added to the calendar that next Wednesday is our exam one. So what that usually means is on this Wednesday, which is two days from now, I will go over the exam one from last semester. The exam one from last semester is already in the announcement. You know, I sent it to all of you last week. So I would strongly suggest, you know, if you have time to go over the exam one you know, on your own before Wednesday and try to answer those questions as much as you can. Because, you know, they're not easy questions, okay? Because they're not supposed to be easy questions. So I would suggest that you review the material and try to answer those questions as you review the material, okay? Just, you know, kind of imagine that you have all the resources available to you and see if you can answer those questions as much as you can. <clears throat> Question? Is this Wednesday a quiz? No. Okay. It's a practice, though. No. It's, it's quote, unquote, a practice, which means, you know, I go over the exact exam from last semester with the entire class. Okay. <clears throat> Which is a, a great opportunity for people to ask questions. Okay, so if you're running into some questions, it's like, I'm not really sure how we figured this part out, you know, Wednesday would be a good time to do that. But it's better if you prepare for it. In other words, if you study and you try your best to answer those questions before coming to class on Wednesday, that way you benefit the most from that session on Wednesday. Because I have heard a lot of people saying, when you explained it, it sounded so easy and I can follow. And in the exam, you know, some people find difficulty, you know, doing, you know, answering those questions on their own. So that's why it's good to practice on your own first before you listen to my you know, answer. Um, also, just as, you know, just some information, not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I got you know some news from one of my students who transferred, and you know the student said you know the this class this exact class last semester uh, prepared him well for you know his endeavor now at a four year university. So I think it's a good thing for the most part because you know it means that if you pass this class with a A and a B, I cannot really speak for C. Um, that means you know, you're probably ready for the upper division version of this class at a four-year university. So I suppose the good news is good news for most people. All right, so I'm going to go forward. And one thing is you, know, you want to look at the calendar for this class because I put the exam on the calendar. There's also a way to synchronize the Canvas calendar with your calendar app on a mobile device. And I strongly suggest that you guys do that too, because this way, you know, everything that shows up on this calendar will show up on your mobile device. So in here, you can see how on the 27th, um, I have scheduled uh, the Monday, Wednesday CISP 310 class to have exam one. So if you have your calendar here synchronized with your mobile device, then you can look at your mobile device calendar and it's going to show up. Um, so just a suggestion. So what we'll do today is we are going to talk about signed versus unsigned representation, which I believe we talked about a little bit last time. Is that correct? Okay. So what we'll do is I am going to talk about, did we talk about modulo that math or congruent modulo and? I don't think I, we talked about that. Okay, that's okay. So the way that I talk about this is I'll start with something that's really kind of abstract. And then we'll kind of go back and talk about something that's more tangible, you know, something that you can actually, um, you know, there's more hands-on stuff with it. So, so the question here, you know, uh, in section one is, you know, integers are always represented on the computer using a fixed number of binary digits. So you can have 16-bit integers, you know, back in the good old days, 32-bit integers or 64-bit integers, which is usually the default for today's your compiler. So given that, you can only represent values up to a certain point, and beyond that, it goes around in a loop. So let me illustrate what I mean by going around in a loop. So let me start up my trusty tablet first. There we go. 
and then move it into your view. So give me a second here. There we go. All right, so imagine that we are only using four bits, okay? So we are dealing with something that only has four bits. So can someone tell me how many combinations of zeros and ones do I get with only four individual bits? So we have, go ahead. 32 or 64? No. Nope. 16. And why, how did you arrive to 16? Two to the power of four. That is correct. So when you have two four digits, then the least significant bit will have a zero or one. The next one also has a zero or one. The next one also has a zero or one. The next one also has a zero or one. The best way to visualize why we have exactly 16 possible ways to arrange the zeros and ones is to look at it as from the tree perspective. So many of you have not taken CISP 430, and that's okay. This is just a way to look at things. If you understand you know, the tree you know, representation of a folder system, this, is, this should be fine. So with the most significant bit, you know, with this one, it, you have two choices, right? You know, it can be a zero or one. But given each choice, then this digit can also have two choices, a zero or one, a zero or one. So now we move on to this, uh, this digit over here, which is the, uh, this is digit zero, digit one, digit two, and digit three. So these two choices are for digit three, and then these four choices are for digit two, and then digit two can be zero or one, zero or one, and this is for digit one. Actually, I, I, I think I misrepresented here you know, the circles. Give me a second to fix that. Undo, undo, undo. Okay, so I should put it like this. These two are the choices for bit three. These four are the choices for digit three and digit two, and then these branch out like so, right? And then these are for digit one in combination with digit two and three, and then these two also branch out like so. I'm not gonna label the zeros and one because you know, that's gonna take a lot of time. But now we have 16 leaf leaves you know, at, on, on this tree because each one at the very end here is representing a four-bit pattern. Which four bits are we talking about? Well, it depends on how you go all the way back to the to the root of the tree. So this is one way to visualize you know, how with only four bits, you get 16 ways of arranging the zeros and ones. Is that okay? Is that making any sense? Okay. All right, so that means if I want to look at a number line, okay, um, representing you know, the 16 digits. One way is to draw a linear line, but that's not going to be a very good way to do it because a linear line means you know we should be able to go beyond you know 16 of these you know, uh, individual zeros and ones. So instead of using a line, I use a circle. So I will you know, put these as zero 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 here. This would be one zero zero zero. This one here would be zero one zero zero. This one here is going to be one one zero zero. I mean, this is just an easier way to make sure that the circle has almost equal distance here you know, between the points. So this one is going to be zero zero one zero, zero one one zero, one zero one zero, and this is going to be one 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 zero. And then now I have now I can put in the remaining of the slots. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, and then 1, 1, 1, 1. All right. So are we, do we have any questions about this number circle or number wheel? Now, why is it a wheel? Okay. Because with only four bits, okay. You would normally say, okay, zero, 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 zero. I'm going to use a mouse pointer this time. This will represent the value of zero. That makes sense, right? This will represent the value of one. 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. That would make sense. But then when I ask you, what about nineteen? How do I represent nineteen on this wheel? There are two possible answers. One is nineteen cannot be represented on this wheel. That's a good answer, okay? Because you know, definitely we cannot represent nineteen when your largest integer that can be represented is one 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 one, which is only fifteen. But the second answer is well, we can sort of represent nineteen because if I look at this as sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, ah, oh, this can be looked at as nineteen. Okay, now that is what congruent modulo n is trying to say. Because you know, basically what we're doing is we are looking at if 19 were to be represented, it would correspond to the bit pattern of 0, 0, 1, 1. But then we opened up a, whole, a huge can of worm, which is, so is that 3 or is it 19? We say, how about both? Okay. We consider both to be quote unquote equivalent when we are working on this wheel. Okay, so I know that sounds really confusing. So we'll, what we'll do is we're gonna switch back to the notes a little bit to talk about a certain notation that typically is not introduced you know, until later, but I think in this class, it is a very useful uh, concept to talk about before we move on to choose complement. So what we do is we define it, you know, this is the math way or Wikipedia way of saying that A and B are congruent modulo N. Okay? I know it sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo, just bear with me for the time being. Okay? So the first notation, which is where the mouse pointer is at, is saying that A and B are congruent modulo N. That's the way to say it. But what does it mean? Congruent, what does it mean? What is, why do we have a modulo n you know, uh, in this whole thing? So we'll explain that later. Okay? You know, we'll define that later. I'm lazy, so I don't like to say you know, mod n in parentheses. So what I do is I just you know, put a suffix of n next to the equivalence you know, symbol. So this is my way of saying a and b are congruent modulo n. It's just a shorthand, okay? You know, because I just prefer to have a shorter and more concise way to describe the things instead of the long way. That still doesn't describe what it is. This is the definition. So the definition of A and B being congruent modulo n simply says that given A and B are integers, V is also an integer that is less than n but greater than or equal to zero. It means that I can express A as B plus some multiple of N. K of A has to be an integer. And I can also express B exactly the same way, which is V, the same V, plus a possibly different KB times the same N. Okay, so that still looks kind of abstract, right? It's like, okay, can, can we use some examples to illustrate it? The answer is yes, we can use a bunch of examples. So we'll take a look at some examples. Where's my pen right here? Okay. And start, I'm starting a new slide first. We'll get back to the circle in just a little bit. So let's say I choose n to be, let's pick n to be a smaller number like four, okay? So now the question is, is five congruent modulo four with, oh, I don't know, let's try 17, okay? So what do you have to do now? You now have to try to find all the things. Okay, so we have, in this case, A is 5, B is 17. So now we're looking for a V of some kind. So you look at 5 and go like, hmm, I think V can be 1. Okay, because 5 can be expressed as 1 plus 1 times 4. So I think this 1 fits the position of B. Are we good so far? Then the next question is, can I express 17 in a similar way? So now can I say 17 is one plus something times four, but this something here has to be an integer. So you go through your algebra and go like, hmm, 
4, exactly. So we do find a 4 here. So that means, yes, this is actually true. 5 and 17 are indeed congruent modulo 4. Is that okay? Should we go through another example, or you guys are feeling okay with this? Buy more example? Sure. Yeah. So let's find an example where it does not work out. Okay? So let's say we say, how about 5 is modulo congruent? Congruent modulo with 15, okay? So now you say, okay, same story. 5 is 1 plus 1 times 4. This is a multiplication. 15 is 1 plus, oh, no, the, this one here can be anything. Oh, this one can, no, this has to be the same one. So this part has to be the same, plus whatever times 4. So this 4 here has to be the same. The question is, can this slot here, does this, is this slot an integer? The answer is, no, it's not an integer because 15 minus 1 is a 14. 14 divided, divided by 4 is a rational number. It is a fraction, but it is not an integer. So as a result, you know, 5 is congruent modulo 4 with 15 is false. So we say is false. Are we still doing okay so far with this? Yes? Okay, all right. So why is this important? Well, it actually answers two different questions. The first question is, if we want to represent negative numbers, can we use this to our advantage? Okay, that's the first question. The second question is, if we want to perform a what is equivalent to arithmetic negation, which is just flipping the sign of a number, how do we do that to binary numbers? So we would answer both of those questions. Okay, so let's go answer the first question first, which is how do we look at negative values and still be able to use um, binary numbers to represent negative values? Because that presents you know, some kind of interesting challenges. So what we'll do now is we switch back to the number wheel. And this time I'm going to use a different color to kind of highlight your know, things that would seem make, to make sense. So I'm going to say, well, this is just representing 0 you know, as a value. This represents 1 as a value, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Seven. I don't think anyone's going to complain about this and go like, oh, we don't want you know, these particular big pattern to represent the value that is written in green. It seems to make sense, right? Because after all, if you have one of one, none of two, one of four, and none of eight, four plus one is five. It makes perfect sense. Is that, is that okay? <clears throat> then I'm going to use blue. Okay, there's a reason why I'm switching color to finish the rest of the wheel. In other words, this is going to be 8, this is 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Okay, well, that seems to make sense. But none of these is a negative number, right? A negative value. I'm only associating the bit patterns with non-negative values. But in computer science, in your applications of your algorithms, many times you need to represent negative values. Okay, so the question now is, how are we going to represent negative values? So one thing you might notice is in order to increase a value, we turn, if you kind of imagine you have a, a hand, okay, to increase the value, you turn which, in which way? Clockwise, very good. Okay, that seems to make sense because I, we can definitely see, you know, going from five to six, you are rotating the hand clockwise, which means to decrease is to turn the other way, which is counterclockwise. Is that okay? Does everybody see what I mean by turning the hand you know, clockwise to increase a value and turning it counterclockwise to decrease a value? Okay, all right. So what does that have anything to do with what we are talking about here? 
So if I were to represent negative one, just thinking from the perspective of rotating the hand, where do you think that negative one should go? 15. Where 15 is, right? Where one, 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 one is the big power. So that seems to make sense. I mean, just intuitively, it really makes sense. Okay, so I'm going to use red now because usually red represents something that is negative. So I'm going to put a negative one here. But if you want to decrease negative one one more time by one, where would that land? Where 14 is, okay? So negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, negative seven, and then negative eight. So now we can see that some of these values or some of these bit patterns, we only have one usable or sensible interpretation. Those are the green ones. The green ones only have one sensible interpretation. So if I just pick one random one, like this one, 0, 1, 1, 0, as a 4-bit pattern, it only makes sense to locate it as 6. But some of the other ones has two labels, one label in blue, one label in red. The blue label says, hey, if this is an unsigned, it is representing the blue value. If it is a signed integer, then it's representing the red value. Are we doing okay so far? So now it is an interpretation, interpretation question. Is the variable, the bit pattern, supposed to be signed or unsigned? That is the question. In C and C++, that decision has to be made ahead of time, before you even write any code to make use of the variable. Because when you declare an integer, it is int or unsigned. Right? So by the time you declare the variable, you have already said, this is going to be, in, be, this is interpreted as a signed integer, which means when it comes to the other half of the wheel, we are going to choose, we're going to choose the red interpretation. On the other hand, if you say an, a variable is unsigned, then you have already chosen to use the blue interpretation, you know, when you write your code, in comparison, in multiplications, in divisions, and so on. Is that okay? Is that making any sense? Are we connecting this number, number wheel to the signed versus unsigned concept that you have already learned in CISP 360? We good? Okay. So you look at this and go like, I still do not see why this has anything to do with uh, congruent modulo n. Okay. Well, let's take a look here. So we're going to pick a few examples. So I'm going to pick uh, negative 4. So in this case, I'm switching back to the black you know, color here. So in this wheel, negative 4 is modulo, congruent modulo 16 with um, the other thing that is using that slot. So negative 4 is congruent modulo is Negative 4 and 12 are modulo congruent 16. You feel like, but I don't see how that can be the case. Okay, so let's let's check it out. So we can express, okay, let's do the easy one first, okay? So we can express 12 as 12 plus 0 times 16. Easy peasy. Yes? Okay. So then we look at the other one, we look at negative 4, and then we ask, can we express it like this? We have no choice but to use the same v, no choice but to use the same n, but can we choose a different multiplier to make this work? Once again, apply algebra, okay? So that's why algebra is important, okay, you know, to solve even something like this. So you say, okay, so the unknown, which is the empty slot, needs to be on one side all by itself. So you say, okay, let's subtract 12 from both sides. Negative 4 minus 12 is negative 16, and it is unknown times 16. Then we have to you know, divide both sides by 16. So on one side, you have negative 16 divided by negative 16, 
the other side you have the unknown times 16 divided by 16, right? 16 divided by 16 cancels out. We only get the unknown left on the right-hand side. But then on the left-hand side, we have negative 1. We solve the equation. We go like, oh, okay, I can put a negative 1 here. We go like, but in all the examples that we have shown, I never you know, use anything that's negative. But remember, the only constraint for the multiply of 16 is that it has to be an integer. Is negative 1 an integer? It is. So that means, huh, okay, so this is another way to look at the bit pattern of 1, 1, 0, 0. It can be used to represent 12, okay, but it can also be used to represent negative 4 because 4 and 12 are congruent modulo 16. So is that okay so far? So I presented a intuitive way of interpreting which bit pattern can be interpreted you know, as which value, but at the same time, we also now have introduced the math concept behind the whole thing, which is congruent modulo n, and in this case, n is 16, because the wheel has 16 slots. Are we doing okay so far with this? Are we good? Okay, so I'm going to present you know, one more thing, which is something that we have talked about already, but I'm going to talk about it one more time. Do you remember VSXN? The signed value represented by X as a bit pattern using N bits. Okay, we talked about this. It is sigma I goes from zero to n minus 2, x of i times 2 to the power of i minus x of n minus 1 times 2 to the power of n minus 1. That's the definition. We also have vu xn, and that is i uh, the sigma of i going from 0 to n minus 1, x of i times 2 to the power of i. I hope you vaguely remember this because this is also another way to ask, so what is the signed interpretation or the signed value represented by bit pattern? Use this one, okay? What is the unsigned value represent, represented by bit pattern? Use VU. But if you apply these two, you end up with exactly the same values when, when N is 4. Okay, I just made a claim, okay? What do you do when I make a claim? You double check it, right? You, you try to validate using what you have learned already. So the question is, can you validate? Can you look at, well, I'm just gonna pick on 1100 today. So can you look at 1100, plug it into BS 1100, 4, and come back with the answer of negative four. Well, let's check, okay? One, one, zero, zero. We have none of one, none of two, one of four. So the sigma is only adding to four. But then, because n is four, so that means x of n minus one is x of three, which is the most significant bit of one over here. What we multiply that to? 2 to the power of n minus 1. n is 4. 4 minus 1 is 3. So 2 to the power of 3 is a 6, is an 8. So now we have 4 minus 8, which is negative 4. That works out. What about the other way? What about the unsigned interpretation? We plug in the same thing here. We plug in 1100 zero, zero as our x and n being 4, because we're only looking at 4 bits. So in that case, everything is just added together. None of 1, none of 2, 1 of 4, 1 of 8. 4 plus 8 is indeed 12. So they all work out. It's just different ways of looking at the same thing. Are we still doing okay so far? Yes? Okay, 
This is the pragmatic way of looking at things. It gives you a way to evaluate, to come back with you know, the value being represented. This is the intuitive way. Okay, you look at the wheel and you just go like, if I turn in the clockwise direction, I'm increasing. If I turn in counterclockwise, I'm decreasing. And I'll label the bit patterns accordingly. But then we also look at it from the perspective of mathematics and using the congruent modulo n perspective, go like, oh, okay, this looks a little abstract, but in the end, it really does, does the same thing. It gives us you know, another way to look at things. So the, the second, uh, chapter two, or section two, is really just giving you the same thing. I, I, I did not specify the, uh, the bit patterns you know, over here, but basically I'm just saying that if you look at eight, eight is modulo, is eight and negative eight are congruent modulo 16. 9 and negative 7 are congruent modulo 16, and so on. That's basically what this table is trying to convey. But the best way is really not to look at it as a table. The best way is to look at it as a wheel. The wheel conveys exactly the same idea as the table, except it, is, it actually makes more sense. Are we doing OK so far with these concepts? Right. So with signed representation, one of the things that we want to ask is, how do we flip the sign of a value? So if you give me negative 4, how do I flip the sign so it becomes 4? If you give me 4, how do I flip the sign so it becomes negative 4? This is a, non, this is a trivial question in normal notation, because we just add a, add a negative, a unary operator of negative in front of the value then we have arithmetic negation. Does everybody understand what I mean by arithmetic negation? Okay, because I don't want to confuse that with logical negation, which is simply not, right? But this is arithmetic negation. So I want to do the same thing, but using only bit operations. So that becomes go like, okay, how do we do that? Yes, we can always have your zero minus your something, you know, that works too. But there's also a different operator. It's called two's complement. So when we talk about two's complement, which is down here, we look at it from the perspective, I would try to look at it from the perspective of math, but using modulo congruent n. So now we look at this thing here and go like, OK, negative b is modulo congruent with negative b plus k times n for some k, which is an integer. Is that okay so far? Because this is the definition of what is modulo, I mean congruent modulo n. That's the definition. Okay? So if that is okay, then we okay, we'll we'll look at this long derivation step by step. Okay? I will try to use the mouse pointer. So this way when you guys are reviewing using the recording, you will also actually see what I mean by that. So negative v is mod is congruent modulo n with negative v plus n. Do we have a problem with that? Does that meet the definition of congruent modulo n? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, because you know, the, the, the multiply of n is simply a one, okay? Is one an integer? Yes, okay, so we're good. Okay, I've got to wait until he's back before I take a roll. So now I'm asking, is negative minus v plus n the same thing as minus v plus in two double parentheses, n minus one, close one, plus one, close the other? You go like, tag, aren't you making things like overcomplicated? Because this negative minus one and this plus one cancel out. So we end up with negative v plus n, just like the statement before. Does that make any sense? So it would seem like you know I'm making things more complicated than it needs to be, and then I rearrange rearranging things a little bit using the associative law and also the commutative law in arithmetic. I rearrange things so that it looks like n minus one the whole thing minus v plus one. Is that working out for you? Is your algebra up to speed? And you go look at 
this expression, you look at this expression, and then in your head, you just go like, yeah, looks about right, okay? Because your n minus one is still here, uh, minus b is also over here, and then the plus one is also over here. I just changed the ordering and the grouping of things a little bit. Are we still doing okay so far with the derivation? Doesn't look like it has anything to do with two's complement at this point. So the bottom line is that the, the arithmetic negation of B is congruent modulo N with N minus one, the whole thing, minus B, and then plus one to the entire thing. Okay, so that doesn't seem very important. So now, okay, since you're back, we're gonna take row. So go ahead and sign in if you have not done so. And I need to adjust the time for you guys to sign in. But that's okay. Well, I'll give you guys enough time. It is 11.07. Oh, I may not even need to do that. Uh, the, oh, go back. And let's see, publish, there we go. So the access code is tilde. I think we got the right time and the right date. So tilde is T-I-L-D-E. That's your access code for row taking. So I'll let you guys do this first and then we'll get back to the whole math thing. There's a reason why tilde is used as today's access code, and we'll get to that too. All right, so is, does anyone need more time to get this part done? Okay. The access code is here. Right. Okay, so I'm moving forward, okay, but you know, the access code is already on the whiteboard. So for people who are a little bit behind, you can just kind of try to catch up. All right, so why, this, why is this important? So the thing is, let's try to make n you know, 2 to the power of w. I chose the, the letter w for width, okay, the number of bits that we are using on an integer, and that's why w, w for width. So if w is four, then n is 16, which is the example that we have been using this entire class. Okay, so our equation here becomes, you know, negative v is, and this expression here is congruent modulo two to the power of w. I simply replace all the occurrences of n with two to the power of w. Is that part okay? Okay, all right. So there's something special about two to the power of w minus one, that whole thing minus v. This part here is a little bit special. Let me just kind of make sure we know which part here. This part is a little special. So the reason why it is special is because two to the power of w minus one is just a binary number that has w once. Let me say that one more time. Two to the power of w minus one as a value in base two is basically w once as a number, as a binary number. Okay, I just made a claim. What do you do? You validate it, right? Okay, so you, don't, you do not need to necessarily prove it in a mathematical sense. But you might want to plug in, okay, so let's plug in W being 4. Why 4? Because we have been talking about 2 to the power of 4, or using 4 bits, the entire class today. So, okay, so let's do that. What is 2 to the power of 4? 16. 16 minus 1 is 15. How do you represent 15 as a base 2 number? In other words, how do you re-express it as a sum of non-recurring powers of two. 
bunch of ones because you have one of one, one of two, one of four, and one of eight. One plus two plus four plus eight is 15. In other words, as a base two number, binary number is one, 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 one. Hmm. Okay, try another one. Try W being five. What is two to the power of five? 32. 32 minus one is 31. How do you express 31? Well, since I'm lazy, I'm just going to say 15 plus 16. Because we already know that 15 is 1, 1, 1, 1. So now we just have to deal with the 16. But what is 16? It is by itself a power of 2. It is 2 to the power of 4. So that means 31 is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay? So even though this is not a mathematical proof, it gives us enough you know, just enough confidence to say that, okay, that seems to work out. Is that okay? All right. So what does that have anything to do with anything? So what that has to do with something is for any W that is greater than 1, in other words, we're talking about 2, 3, 4 bit you know, numbers, the binary representation of 2 to the power of W minus 1 consists of W contiguous ones, which we have already kind of validated already. So in the subtraction you know, module, this is relating what we're talking about here to an, a module that we have already talked about. We talked about t of i plus 1 is b of xiyi plus b of qiki. I really hope that you do not find this you know, new anymore because we have been talking about this like a lot. And then we re-express that using Boolean operators. So it is the same thing as the negation of xi and yi or the negation of xi exclusive or with yi, because that is how we define q of i, and ti. So are we still looking, is this still looking okay? In other words, do we have the knowledge from previous classes? Okay, very good. So if xi is guaranteed a 1, because here we have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 as the Mino n, the mino n is the, is the number that is being subtracted from. So if x of i is guaranteed to be 1, and the initial t of 0 is assumed to be 0, then we can prove that t of i is always going to be a 0. There will be no cases of borrowing. Does that make sense to you? OK, let me illustrate what I mean by that. So. We are basically looking at 1, 1, 1, 1, minus uh, y3, y2, y1, y0. Okay, we have an initial 0 here for t of 0. So all I'm saying is I don't even need to know what is y0 to y3. I am guaranteed to have an entire row of zeros for t. Does that make sense to you? Why does it make sense to you? Well, it just kind of makes sense, right? But there's a reason why it makes sense. Because what can y, uh, y of i can possibly be? It can be a 0 or 1, right? It can be nothing else. If it is a 1, then you end up with a 0. OK, so if y something is a, zero, is a 1, you end up with a 0 here. And then you have 0 minus 0 being you know, a 0, but there's no borrow. But what if y0 is a 0, then you have a 1 here. 1 minus whatever always does not have a borrow in base 2. So you always end up with no borrow. So that's kind of a, I would say this is a really fuzzy and vague proof of the whole thing, because I don't want to talk about uh, proof by induction in this class. How many people have heard of proof by induction? Okay, that's a 440 concept. So if you have taken CISP 440, you can try to prove this. Okay, try to try to prove the theorem that you know if your mino n are all ones, then the entire row of carry the t bits, they're all going to be zeros. Okay, you can do it by proof by induction. But in this class, we're not going to do the proof. We're just going to say, okay, there's no borrow. But then when you look at the sum, okay, or the difference here. What do you think the difference is guaranteed to be? If you look at this digit here, 
how does that relate to y of z? How do you think about a question like that? You think about what can y0 possibly be? Well, it's base 2, right? So y0 can only be 1 or 0. So you work on both cases. So what if y0 is a 0? Well, if y0 is a 0, we have 1 minus 0 being a 1, 1 minus 0 being a 1. What if y0 is a 1? Then you have 1 minus 1, which is a 0. 0 minus 0 is also a 0. OK. Let me get this straight. So are you telling me that in this special case, that is just the negation of y0? Yep, that's what I'm telling you. What about y1 then? What about d of 1? Is that really just you know, the negation of y1? Yep, that's just the negation of y of 1. This is just the negation of y of 2. And this is just the negation of y of 3. This only happens because the minuend, which is what we call x, are ones. They're all ones. OK, I'm going to pause here to see if anyone has any questions. Question? No. Okay. Okay, I just made a claim. Okay, I just made a claim that D, the D of I, is just the negation of the Y, of the same bit position. What do you do? You want to double check, right? You know, at least plug in some number and see if that works out. So we will plug in, let's say, yeah, we are totally picking on 1100 zero, zero today. Okay, there's a zero here. All right, so again, we're going to work, it, work this out using um, binary operators. So now we have the exclusive OR between these two is a 1. The exclusive OR between 1 and 0 is a 1. The exclusive OR between 1 and 1 is a 0. Same thing over here. So there's an initial T of 0 being 0 here. This is going to be a 0 because, you know, because 1 minus 0 does not have a borrow. 1 minus 0 does not have a borrow. Or I can say the negation, the negation of 1 and this 0 is a 0. The negation of 1 and this 0 is also a 0. 0 or 0 is a 0, okay, to use the binary definitions. So we end up with an entire row of zeros here. And now we have exclusive or again, 1, 1, 0, 0. So now you ask yourself, are the d bits indeed the negation, a logical negation of the y bits? The answer is, yeah, that seems to work out. X, Y, Q, T, D. So in this specific case, D of I is the logical knot of Y of, y of I. Are we doing okay so far with the overall you know, claim as well as the example that has all the bits worked out? We good? Okay. Well, so instead of saying how each bit is related, the other way to say this is D is tilde Y. Because tilde, as a C operator, means bitwise knot. Okay, the I should not be there. So cross out that I. There we go. Because tilde, as a C operator, means bitwise knot. Bitwise knot literally means in base 2, turn all the zeros into 1s, Turn all the ones into zeros, which is exactly what we did. Are we doing okay so far with this discussion here? Because we're going to plug this back into the main equation after this is all done. Alrighty. Okay. So I will do one more thing. Okay. Till the uh, y in this case. It's also known as the one's complement of y. It's just a name. That's all it is. It's just a label. If y is not of y, it's the same thing as one's complement of y. It's just a name. Are we okay so far with all of these definitions and whatnot? Okay. So now we switch back to the notes. All right, so when we switch back to the notes, you can see that, oh, tech, 
you're just repeating what you have written in the notes. Yeah, that's kind of the idea of a lecture is using some examples, you know, make it more, you know, less abstract and less boring and dry. But nonetheless, it's the same concept. So what we end up here is that negative v is 2 to the power of w minus 1, the whole thing minus v plus 1. We establish in this part from above. But now we look at 2 to the power of w minus 1, the whole thing minus v, using what we have learned from here. We now say, oh, that's just you know, the, the midwise knot of v plus 1. Are we doing OK so far with why this whole thing is this thing? Yes? There are a lot of steps in between, okay? So, meaning that there are a lot of things that you have to connect. But are you feeling comfortable that, yeah, we just you know, kind of looked at the math in, because two to the power of w minus one is a bunch of ones in base two. And if you subtract another bit pattern from it, it's the same thing as turning all the ones and into, turning all the ones into zeros and turning all the zeros into ones. But that's the same thing as a bitwise knot. Bitwise knot does exactly the same thing. So that's why we make that connection. Are we doing okay so far? Because this is a very important step, which is you know, why we have this equality here, where the mouse pointer is. Yes? Be okay? All right. So it's called one's complement. It's like, oh, but we talked about this too. It's just a notation. So that's why two's, uh, the two's complement of x is defined to be the one's complement, the one's complement of x plus one. That is how we define two's complement. So once again, I just mentioned the word of definition. What do you do with definitions? Yep, you put it somewhere that you can find. I can find this, okay? I don't need to find it because I teach this. So because I am not taking notes, doesn't mean that you should not be taking notes, okay? So I would definitely, you know, either, you know, if you have the notes in front of you and you have an iPad or something, you know, just highlight it. Or if you are keeping everything on a piece of paper, add this to the definitions, okay? Keep all the defini definitions together. All right, so now we look at some examples. So in this case, three is uh, zero, zero, one, one. So, and I claim, okay, one more claim here. I forgot this paragraph. Two's complement is important because it is a way to perform a arithmetic negation using bitwise knot and the addition of one. What do you mean by that? What this means is literally what it says. When you perform two's complement, it is the same thing as performing arithmetic negation, okay? Seems kind of odd, right? So we'll use an example. So now we say, how is negative three represented as a sign for the integer? The easy answer to that question is, oh, we just have to go back to that number wheel thing. Look up negative three, it's right here. It is one, one, zero, one. But that's not calculation. This is looking up something that is already done for you. So how do we do it as a calculation? So we look at negative 3 as the negation of 3. So let me see if I can zoom, scroll. Oh, yes, I can indeed scroll. There we go. So negative 3 is the negation of 3. Okay, this is the negation of 3. But I claim that the negation of arithmetic negation is the same thing as the 2's complement. So that's, that's why I can say, oh, negative 3 is the 2's complement of the representation of 3 as a base two number. Is that okay? Okay, because of the claim, okay? Because of the claim that arithmetic negation is the same thing as two's complement. So then we carry out the two's complement, which is one's complement, the one's complement of the same bit pattern, which is zero, zero, one, one, plus one. The one's complement of zero, zero, one, one is flipping all the zeros to ones and all the ones into zeros. So we end up with one, one, zero, zero in base two. Is that part okay? Okay. So we have to remember to add one to this whole thing, so it becomes one, one, zero, one. But that's exactly where it goes in the circle. 
Remember the number circle? Negative three indeed corresponds to the slot that has a binary representation of one, one, zero, one. So all of this stuff ties in, okay? Two's complement, congruent modulo n, the number circle, and what we want to do, which is representing negative values, they all tie in. So the next, uh, the next section you know, basically talks about, so which way do we look at 1101? Is it 13 or is it negative 3? The answer is, you know, I have talked about this in this class already. The, 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 the response to this question is, why do you care? What is the context in which you really need to know whether 1101 is 13 or negative 3? Are you adding this to another number? If so, you don't have to know which way it is, because the binary adder and the binary subtractor that we have talked about work, they work regardless of whether it is signed or unsigned. They don't, it, it doesn't care. Okay? So the only time this matters is when you compare. Because if you're comparing 1101 as a bit pattern to 0000 as a bit pattern, then it really matters, because 13 is greater than 0, but negative 3 is less than 0, because in that case, it does matter which way you want to look at it. But we are not going to talk about binary comparison just yet, okay? Up to this point, we only need to know how do we represent negative values as an integer, uh, what is congruent modulo n, what is 2's complement, because all of those concepts form the foundation of how we look at binary numbers. Right. Any questions? No questions? All right. Let me kind of, yep. This is the end of this chapter, which is, this is the end of the scope of your first exam. So we do not have any questions. If there are no questions, do you want me to go over the practice exam? So we just start a little bit early. You know, I said we'll do it on Wednesday, but since we don't have anything else to do right now, we can start doing it. Is that okay? All right. Yep. When is the, um, Say again? Oh, when is the first exam? Uh, next Wednesday. So, nine days from today. All right. So what we'll do is now we go back to take a look at our exam one. This is from last semester, from spring 2023. And it's a PDF. So we'll go ahead and just take a look at the PDF here. The first five questions are kind of the same thing, and I was being extra kind here. I gave people these definitions. In other words, just in case you did not have your definitions and you did not bring any notes with you, well, at least we got this, okay? But do not count on me always you know, giving you the definitions. So this time I, used, I gave these definitions because I want your answer to be explained using those definitions. Yes? Uh, for the quiz, do we get like one page of notes? Do we get our, our whole notebook? Unlimited. Okay. As long as there's no electronics, you know, as long as it's on paper and it's done prior to the exam, you can bring in textbooks, all your notes, all my modules, all the past exams that you can find, doesn't matter. Is printed okay? Printed is fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So either printed or handwritten prior to the test. I have to say prior to the test because I don't want people to pass notes to each other and saying that, but you said it's okay as long as it's written, so I'm writing this right now and pass it on to my buddy who's sitting next to me. So that would not be okay because it has to be done prior to the test. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. So, but I do have to warn, you know, take, bringing too much material can be detrimental because it means it's harder to find the material, okay? So you want to bring in, okay, do it this way, two-tier system. 
First here would be your own notes, your own study guide. The definitions all kind of neatly put into one place. Examples in everything that you think will help you, okay, in the text. Then you have the second tier being all the modules printed out, the past exams printed out, just in case you need it, okay? So this way, most of the stuff you can find in your quote unquote first tier material, which hopefully is only a few pages long, if that, okay? But if you go like, oh, but I vaguely remember there's a question like this five years ago, and you know, <laughs> and that somebody gave me the answer to that test, okay, fine, you'll dig that up and see if you, you have a match. I don't think that's gonna be a match, but you know, I, you never know. All right, so getting back to here, so you have to read the question carefully, okay? That's one thing that we all have to do. Do not make the assumption that I'll be asking the same kind of question as the practice exam, which is what we're looking at right now, okay? So I will always you know, try to remind people to read the questions. In questions one to five, solve for all unknown bits in a one bit subtractor. So the key here is we're dealing with a subtractor. Note that in a one bit adder or subtractor, bit zero is the sign bit when interpreted signed. Use the five row format in your answer with the rows labeled X, Y, Q, T, and D. Hopefully those letters are no longer foreign to you. All rows other than T has one bit per column, whereas T has two bits per column. Or two bits slash columns. Okay, so there are two of those. There's T0 and T1 in this case. Also include the overflow, the less than flags. We have not talked about the flags, so those would not be in your exam as discussed in the reading material, lecture, and labs. You're given the known bits for each question. Figure out the value of the other bits, the following are Boolean equations that you can reference. Show all steps and reasoning in your answer. Now, if the question itself call out for reasoning and explanation, it means without the reasoning, people would not be getting a passive grade, even if the final answer is 100% correct because I'm looking for how you arrive at the answer, more so than what the final answer really is. So for each step, state which rule or rules are applied or which restriction determined by a previous step is used as a constraint, what bit known is known up to this step are utilized, and the conclusion, and so on. Okay, well since the overflow you know, stuff is not discussed yet, so I cannot use overflow or the sign bit. So most of these questions may not apply as much, but I can use this one as an example. So you only know D of zero is a one, T of one is a zero. I'm asking you to figure out all of the other bits. So let me write it down on my tablet and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll think about how to do this, right? Okay, so we have um, x0 minus y0 is q0 minus t0 is d0. We have t1 here. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm copying the question right now. So we have d0 being a 1, t1 being a 0. Okay, now, we, now I'm ready because I have to copy the, uh, the values. All right, so this is, this is what we're dealing with here. We only know two of those, okay? We know D of zero is a one, we know T of one is a zero. Okay, so we go like, okay, so we take out this, because it's already known, it is a one, and we take that out, because we know that is a zero. Now, I have to figure out the rest. In other words, I have to now figure out what is X zero, what is Y zero, what is Q zero, what is T zero. How do we do this? What is your first thought, okay? In other words, when you are faced with something like this, what do you do first? T zero zero. So you refer back to what T zero um, depends on and what the D depends on. Yes, okay, so looking at the dependency between the digits. And where do we find the dependency of the digits? Why do you think, I kept telling you, if you see a definition, <laughs> put it to one place. We want to reference the definitions of the bits. 
Is that okay? So we look at all the definitions, which is already given to you in the test. Okay, if I just go back to the test a little bit, it's already given to you. It's all here, right? Which means, okay, so, but how do we make use of those definitions? So what, we, what do we know? Okay, you start with what is known already. We know that D0 is a 1, but that 1 is because of the exclusive OR between the Q and the T. Is that okay? You look at this and go like, but that really doesn't tell us what is Q0 and what is T0. Well, not exactly, but it gives you some information. What are the possibilities here? Okay, we don't have a unique answer just because of this constraint. So once again, this is called constraint-based reasoning, which means we look at this and go like, it doesn't tell us the answer exactly, but it puts some constraints over what can possibly be the answer. So what do you think are the constraints? What can, what can we limit to at this point? One zero or zero. Hmm? One zero or zero. They, they have to be different, right? So that means we have two ways to proceed. Q0 is a 1, T0 being a 0, or Q0 being a 0, T0 being a 1. Does that make sense? Because when they're both 1s, then D0 would have been a 0. If they're both zeros, then D0 would also would have been a 0. So I have narrowed down the cases to only two possibilities. I look at these two possibilities and I ask, can we further restrict one of them? Can we say, this one is not possible? So we make use of the other bit that is also given to us. The other bit that is also given to us is t of 1. It is to, we were told that it is a 0. But this is basically the negation of x0 and y0, or x, um, take it back, uh, or the negation of q0 and t0. Is that okay? Where do we find this? Have we even talked about this? Yes, we have talked about this. And on top of that, it is also given to you over here. Okay, so the question or the exam is giving you all the pieces that you need. Even for someone who has never taken this class but understand the notation, that person can figure out the answer just because the definitions are already in the test. So you look at this and go like, how do we make use of this? Well, you plug in each scenario. If Q0 is a 0, the negation of that is going to be a 1. T0 has to be a 1 in this case to meet that constraint. So T0 is a 1. So that means this whole thing would have been a 1 if Q0 is a 0 and T0 is a 1. Does that make sense? But that would have contradicted with the known bit of T1 being a zero, which means we have just ruled this out. So we have just ruled this out and go like, nope, that cannot be, because if that were the case, then t of one would have been a one and not a zero. Are we doing okay so far with this line of reasoning? Okay, so we have just locked down two values, okay? We just locked down that t of, uh, t of q of zero is a one, so we know this is a 1, and then we also know t of 0 has to be a 0 over here. Okay, so now how do we figure out x0 versus y0? Look at the definition of q. Look at the definition of q. Very good. So q of 0 is x of 0 exclusive or with y of 0. Wait, and that is known to be a 1 at this point, right? Then you ask... How do we figure out the, what X and Y are supposed to be? Yes. But then how do we say uh, one of those cannot be the case? Okay. Then we look at the of one yep. and see that X is negative. Exactly. So this means so x0 is a 1, and y0 is a 0, or x0 is a 0, and y0 is a 1. But we know this one leads to a contradiction, okay? Contradicts t0 
one is one. So we know this cannot be the case. So now we have just locked down. This has to be a one, and this has to be a zero. So there will be questions like this, okay? Which basically means you have to really know your definitions and how to apply those definitions to help rule out possibilities until you lock down to a specific value for every unknown bit. So that's one type of question. <clears throat> Look at this as binary addition or binary subtraction Sudoku. You guys know about you know, what is a Sudoku as a board, not a board game, but a number game? Okay, it's kind of like that, okay? It's basically applying reasoning to find the answer. Okay, so that's one kind of question. And once again, I cannot, you know, not every single one of these questions can be in your exam because we haven't talked about the overflow flag, which significantly cut down the number of possible questions I can ask. All right, so question number six has many parts. <laughs> um, recall that VUWM is an unsigned interpreter value of a binary number W using the, using the least significant M bits. Okay, so we are only using M of those. Blah, 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 blah. So let VU of X3 is 5 and then VU Y3 is 6. Answer the following parts in a specific, specified order. Figure out the binary representation of X and Y. Okay, how do you do that? What is the question asking you and how do you do it? How do you answer that question? What is the first thing you are going to do? Look up. Definitions, okay? So once again, the first step is always connecting the question to definitions. What definitions are mentioned in this particular question? Get those out, okay? So what is VU of something? Oh, we just add up you know, all the powers of two corresponding to non-zero bits of the bit pattern, okay? So how do we express five? One of one, None of two, one of four, that's it, okay? Because we only need three bits. So five is one, zero, one in base two, six is one, one, zero in base two for the same reason. But you have to show the steps, okay? So you have to tell me how you figure that out or how you, at least how do you verify the result, okay? The second part, in a binary subtraction using borrow look ahead, show all steps starting with the definitions to figure out P and G. P and G should also be three bit wide. You can also show your answer in individual bits. If you choose the multi-bit method, you can use a notation such as blah, 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 you know, exclusive or with blah, blah, blah is this. Of course, you need to use the proper bit values and the proper operations. Okay, so this question, number two, is really just asking, do you know how to define P and G in a subtraction. So you may not be able to record right now, but if your answer is, but I got it written down, I know exactly where to find it right now. Then I go like, yes. I, I would say that you are somewhat prepared for the test, okay? Because if you know where to find the definition, it's as good as knowing the definition. Because in this case, P is the negation of X or G. Uh, or y, then g is the conjunction between the negation of x and y, okay? So do you want me to actually work out the bits or do you understand what I mean by that already? Okay. Well, this one. Show the borrow look ahead equation of t of three. Your answer should start with t of three equals two. How do we answer a question like that? Definitions again, okay? But the definition in binary subtraction may not have a T of three. So what you do is look at the binary addition, look at K of three, and just you know, change all the K of something to T of something. Okay, so that answers three. Three is basically just knowledge. Do you know where to find the definition? If you know, and you can quote the definition, 
That's 25% of question number six. So the last one is assuming t of zero is a zero, substitute the bits of p and g in the borrow look ahead equation of t of three, and then compute the conjunctions, and then the disjunction and show all the mentioned you know, calculations of operations. So that's just plugging in what you already have figured out in question number two, the p and the g's, plug those into what you have figured out in question in part number three, plug those in and perform the actual calculation. That's what it's asking. Are we good so far? Okay, so that's question six. Question number seven is not the same thing. It looks similar, but it's not the same. So it still has to do with, this time it's a VS or the sign interpretation. And we, you are given that X is an M bit minuend, Y is an M bit subtrahend. Subtrahend is uh, basically this is our X and this is our Y. And D is the result of X minus Y using an M bit binary subtraction. We discovered that the difference or D is uh, the sign interpretation of the bit pattern corresponding to the difference is negative 14. We know the sign interpretation of X is 11 and the sign interpretation of Y is negative seven. But I'm not telling you what M is. So M is an unknown at this point. So the first part of the question, worth 10% of the entire thing of question seven, is what is the definition of VS and WN for some bit pattern W and some bit width of N? That's a no brainer, okay? It is about the definition. I think I have mentioned it in every single class since last week, okay? So that means you, know, you hopefully have it written down somewhere. You just quoted the definition, and that's what's 10% already. The next 15% is asking, what is the range of signed value that can be represented using n bits? Specify the most negative value and the most positive value given signed integer. The signed integer has n bits. The answer to this part should be used to help answer the next two parts, okay? So given n bits, what is the least value using the VS equation, and what is the highest value using the VS notation? All right, what do you think? Oh, let's, let's check out the notes, okay? Because you know, it has to be mentioned somewhere in the notes. Right here, generally speaking, given a W bit integer, the range of unsigned is going from here to here. The, sign, the range of int or signed integer is from here to here. Copy and paste from here, from the definition, and you're done with, that, with those 15%. Are we good so far? So did I talk about this in the lecture? I don't remember, actually. But you're supposed to read the notes, okay? You're supposed to read the reading material. Why else do I, would I type the reading material when there's no requirement to read it, okay? So I'm assuming that you have read all the modules up to and including this one, okay? So do not only count on things that I have talked about in class. Occasionally, I missed a few things that are written but not necessarily mentioned in lecture. All right, so that answers the other question. So what else? Okay, the next 30%. Show the steps of how you figure out the minimum number of bits, m of x, to represent x being 11 as a signed integer. That is the minimum mx such that vs x of mx is 11. Okay, so how do you answer that question? So that means, okay, first of all, the first question is, does 11 look like negative to you? No, it's not negative. So that means all the, the entire sigma of the BS notation should add up to 11. Is that okay? So which, which really just kind of boils down to, how do I express 11 as a sum of non-recurring powers of two? 
I have to say non-recurring because otherwise someone can say one plus 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 one. Eleven ones. Now I want non-recurring, so that means it is eight plus two plus one. So eight plus two plus one means we have a power, we have a two to the power three, which means I need four bits just for that sigma notation, but you need one more bit because you have that extra bit to tell you whether you have to subtract uh, 16 or not. So the answer to this question is um, m of x is 5. You need 5 bits, okay, to be able to represent 11 as a signed integer. That's worth 30%. The next 30% is doing about the same thing, but this time you're doing it to y, which is negative 7. So negative as a sign, negative seven as a sign integer. What is the minimum number of bits m of y such that b s y of m of y is negative seven? So how do we figure that out? Okay, does this look negative to you? Yep. Okay. So we know that we have a subtraction of eight, subtraction of sixteen, or subtraction of something. But because it's negative seven, we know. Negative 4 or subtraction of 4 is not enough. Subtraction of 8 should be enough, right? So in order to have a subtraction of 8, you need to have x of 3, or in this case, y of 3, being a 1. So you only need 4 bits in this case to represent y. x requires 5 bits, y requires 4 bits. All right? So then we move on to the next one, which is worth another 10%. Figure out what is m, which is the maximum of mx and my. mx is 5, my is 4, so the maximum is 5. So we need 5 bits for both x and y. And then the last 5% is, um, is it out of the range of the previous step? So if I want to subtract negative 7 from 11, using a 5-bit subtraction, is the result more than out of the range of a 5-bit signed number? The answer is, well, let's figure it out, okay? What is 11 minus negative 7? It's 18. So with 5 bits, what is the largest value you can represent as a signed number using only 5 bits? 15. 15. So it is out of range. Yep. So the answer to part six is yes, it is out of range. All right. So that's kind of the last question, I think, from last semester. Yep, that's it. All right. So knowing this, okay, knowing this is what happened last semester. If you can place yourself, you know, you can time travel back to the previous semester, knowing these are the questions, how would you prepare yourself for the exam? Definition. Okay, you definitely you definitely need the definitions. Okay, so that means you know your your own study guide should have the definitions around. What else? The rest is reasoning. Okay, I don't know how to teach reasoning. I guess you know, there are. That's a philosophy class, I think. Is it Phil 310 or 300? Yeah. yeah. Is it 300 or 310? 310, 310, I think. 310? But do you think it is a difficult class, or have you taken it? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It, it honestly seems a lot like this. It's about moving operations, mm -hmm. but on, on language instead of numbers. Yep. Um, I don't know. I had a good time in that class. It was a little challenging, but... Okay. Well, because they formalize a lot of things. Um, but reasoning, the, the, re the kind of reasoning that we apply to these questions is, I don't think it's too much to ask in a class like this. You know, after 300, 360, you know, this type of reasoning you know, should, be, should be reasonable. Okay? Um, so on... Wednesday, I will talk about this in more details if you guys want me to, especially expanding the actual answer to question number six and seven. And I'll 
try to come up with more examples of the first question, like you know, what other you know, tricky cases we can talk about. But other than that, it's you know, this basically is a is a sample of what happened last semester. I think I have variations of these questions too. So you know that means you know, there are multiple variations you know, of what question one, two, three, four, five may look like, six and seven as well, you know, different numbers, different digits, and so on. All right, so with that all said and done, we can now move on to today's lab, which should not take too much time, okay? Um, on my Thursday class, some people walked out in five minutes. I'm not saying that you should do that, but I'm just saying that it should not be taking too much time. All right, so today's lab is two's complement. I will publish first so that you can find it. The passcode is complementary. Yes, it is a long word, so I'll spell it here. Complementary. Which is not how it is supposed to be spelled in the case of a hotel. Okay, so when they say, oh, we have complementary surfaces, that is a complementary with an I and not an E. So once again, if anyone feels you know, being kind of challenged to fit it through that this class is challenging, I got my office hour. Unfortunately, not today, right after class, uh, because I have a meeting that I have to go to today, so there's no office hour right after class today. <clears throat> I also have time right before class in case anyone wants to talk to me. All right. So with that said, I am done with the recording and I will stop the recording.